Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of the Seven Investing Podcast. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. I'm really excited to be back in the saddle again. We took a, a short break there for the holiday, for Thanksgiving. It's really nice to be back in the podcast and welcome some new perspectives to our show. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about long term investing. Of course, Seven Investing, we're always excited about investing for the long term. And what better advantage do you have to be a long term investor than to get started as soon as possible? And so I'm very excited to welcome my guests today. Maya and Soren Peterson are both investors. They're both very young investors. And we're going to be talking about the power of compounding and getting started with investing at an early age. Uh, Maya, first and foremost, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Soren, it's very nice to meet you as well. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me as well. It's great to be here. Well, let me get started. You guys have both actually written a book that's available on Amazon. It's called Early Bird, The Power of Investing Young. Uh, Maya, let me start with you on the first question for this is, is what prompted you to want to write this book already? Yeah, I've always been a very curious person. Um, so when I was about nine, I started investing uh, and I was handed Growing Money um, by Gail Carlitz. And as I was learning more about investing and, you know, writing emails to random professionals and having them respond to me and talking to them about um, how to invest, what companies to look at, uh, I just began compiling all of my knowledge and everything I've learned over that time and thought it would be helpful for me um, and just as helpful for other people. And honestly, now that I'm in college, reviewing technicals for interviews, I still go back to early bird um, to make sure I have everything nailed down. So it was really helpful back then to make sure I understood because I think the best way to learn is to teach. Um, and it's still helpful to this day. My goodness, starting at nine, that's amazing. That is truly incredible to be starting at such a, such a young age. Uh, Maya, I believe you said you're 19 now, so you're a decade into your investing journey. What's some of the first things that you would say that you learned the most about investing in this in this whole prog progress? Probably humility. It's um, the best to go in, uh, be the dumbest in the room, learn the most in the room, um, and be able to make mistakes. I think from a young age, that's kind of a key power that Soren and I like to talk about. Um, if you're young and you're only investing $25 and that money would have otherwise be spent on like candy or hot chocolate or coffee or something like that, there's not a lot at stake or at risk. And so it's better to learn um, what's good investments, what's bad, how you, um, and what mistakes you've made with that money too. So that's definitely something I learned from you. Maya, I love that advice. I love, I love the quote about being the dumbest person in the room. That's the, definitely the way that you get smarter about things. Uh, Soren, one thing that I know that, that, uh, that you contributed to the book was a lot of interviews with some really high profile other investors. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those and also what you learned from them along the way? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I had the opportunity of talking with a lot of really great investors um, like Ian Castle, who's head of the Microcap Club and founder of it. Um, so he had a lot of really interesting insights about how he got started investing, found Microcaps. Um, yeah, like he started when he was um, get, getting just about to college age and invested his own college fund, which was a pretty interesting story. Um, and then I also got to sp speak with some uh, great people like uh, Annie Duke, who was a poker world champion, because uh, she knows all about decision making, which is obviously a huge portion of investing. So that was really a great opportunity as well. And also, uh, last but definitely not least, we also have. Um, Emily McCormick, who is a banking master going into uh, one of the most complicated industries and describing it very simply so that it's very easy under, to understand. That is fantastic. And by the way, uh, go UMass Amherst, go Babson, <laughs> go Rice University, go University of Texas Longhorns, whatever college you, that you find yourself allegiant to, uh, we're cheering for you out there. But I think this podcast is going to be a really interesting one because we are reaching a younger demographic. A lot of people who are either 17 years old or 19 years old or kind of right there in college might not be thinking about investing. Definitely might not be thinking about long-term investing at this point. Um, let me start with the question uh, of, maybe this one's for you first, Maya, is what would you recommend to someone else who is a collegiate student right now? What would you tell them about investing? And maybe what would you tell them is the greatest benefit to starting so early? 
Yeah. Well, I would echo what I said earlier. Um, just to start, if you start and start with a couple dollars um, and start looking around your dorm, uh, I have my Brita filter in front of me. I have my honey. I have all of these things, you know, looking at the companies that are surrounding you um, within college, things that you use every day, if it's computers, if it's Apple, um, if it's the food and where your food is coming from. And so trying to um, look around you and just discover different companies um, and just be curious and take college as a way to learn about all ways of your life, including investing. Um, and I think it would just be very helpful to also foster conversations if you want to start a little investment club, if they don't have one, um, even to join in and be a part of the conversation and listen in. I think it's a really great place to learn. Um, but of course, right now, college is it's very hard. It's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, draws on every part of aspect of your life. Um, so saving, of course, is incredibly important. And I know there's a lot of support systems in college too. Um, like we have different uh, instructors that can help you go through and budget and stuff like that. And so finding support systems too, to help you learn how to invest and how to allocate your money that will best fit for you. Maya, that's very refreshing. It's something that our audience would definitely support everything that you just said. But let's walk into your world a little bit here. You know, you're a university student. I'm sure that when you say things like that to other students that might not be thinking about investing, I would imagine there's some pushback. You know, people have got to spend their money on beer money or something else other than investing in the stock market. How would you say other students uh, that are 19, 20 years old think about stocks and think about investing right now? Yeah, well, I think it's definitely the uh, GameStop and all of those things that are headlines on the news. Um, less when I start talking about, you know, Ollie's Bargain Outlet or something, some little niche company, they're not as excited to talk about it. Um, but just saving one extra dollar, if you're going to go get your mocha latte, maybe get it with normal milk, or maybe don't get the extra pump and save a couple extra dollars here or there. Um, and then when you feel confident enough to invest, you have that money um, and that little um, uh, what rain fund, rainy day fund or something like that to chip in. Um, but just to start working at it every day, I know days go by really quickly, but they really do count. Um, and so I, I, I think it's probably important. Yeah. So on the same question for you, you know, uh, Maya kind of alluded to the, the GameStop and the AMC and the wall street bets and the diamond hands and the YOLO and all the things that have kind of taken center stage this last year. It seems like there is a power of the crowds now. It seems like there is an interest in learning about investing. What are you seeing, Soren, is in terms of being a high schooler right now, are other high schoolers interested in the investing in investing in the stock market or, or kind of what's your lay on how things look out there? Definitely. Um, yeah. So for high school students, I find there's a lot more interest in it, but there's definitely not much more information about it, or at least most people don't educate themselves more about investing in general, especially not long-term investing. It's all about short-term gains and things like that. Um, and I think my goal has just been to try to turn that into more of a long-term pursuit because people think, oh, 5% or even 1% is nothing. Like that's not that good of a return. But if you go and look at the compound interest over time, that's obviously a lot higher. Um, I tried to demonstrate that in one of the chapters in the book um, that I got to write for the second edition called How to Retire from a Summer Job, where I went through and did the math of if you made $5,000 in a summer for five summers and just invested all that money, that you could go and retire at the age of 65 just from that money alone. That is fantastic. The power of compounding. It's not just about getting in and out within a couple of months or days or hours. <laughs> Uh, but sticking to the course, when you when you have the power of compounding on your side and you're starting earlier, you're, you get a, a huge benefit from doing that. Uh, let's talk about stocks. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about some companies that we like out there. Uh, there's a zillion different ways to be an investor. There's a zillion different ways to be an analyst. Soren, how about you? What, what is a company that you are interested in or that you've invested in and why did you pick them? Yeah, so um, one of the ones I'm watching right now that I invest in is uh, Boston Omaha which I just went to the meeting in November and saw Steve Symington there. And I know Seven Investing is a big fan of Boston Omaha. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a small kind of like a mini Berkshire or Markel that um, holds a lot of different companies like insurance, um, billboards, and much more. Um, yeah. And what drew you to that investment? What, what made you want to invest in Boston Omaha? Yeah. Um, I don't remember. I think I heard about it from... 
my dad or someone, but uh, it was just a really interesting opportunity. It's run by these two young guys, um, Al- Adam and Alex, uh, out of Omaha, Nebraska, and Boston, um, where it gets its name from. And it just seemed really interesting um, that they were trying to do something different. Like there aren't that many companies really structured the way they're structured, having like a core business that pays them a lot of cash in the form of billboards, using insurance as a way to invest that, and now finding more and more new businesses like fiber optics, broadband, and things like that as more ways to deploy that capital. That is fantastic. My final question before I bring it over to Maya again is, is Steve Symington taller than you expected him to be when you met him in person? He definitely was. Yes, (laughs) much taller. Yeah. I would agree with that as well. I think it's part of being from Montana. You've got to be tough and large to fight off the bears up there. How about you? What's what's a company that you have either invested in or are interested in right now and why? Yeah, so Chewy was brought to my attention ago, attention about a couple months ago. Um, and recently they are expanding into pet insurance, I think with True Panion a couple days or so ago. Um, but I really like them because of their customer service and that like intangible asset sort of emote that they have. Um, I found it really interesting. I personally like looking at companies very qualitatively. Um, I get very, very attached to them. Um, And so just hearing stories about people, you know, who pet have died from cancer and so they forgot to um, cancel their auto ship program or something like that. Uh, And then Chewy sends them handwritten letters and flowers and oil paintings um, and really fostering this like personalized community within a very, very large company is pretty unique. Um, And that competitive edge that is something that maybe Amazon, Walmart, um, these bigger companies that are also trying to target that pet market is um, sort of different. So it's a it's an interesting take and something that I've been um, enjoying keeping up with since I've learned about it. Certainly. Some good examples there. Boston, Omaha, Chewy. I also mentioned True Panion. Three companies that are, that are all fantastic there. As we kind of wind this down, I do have another question that I want to ask both of you which is, uh, you know, we always want to be a long-term investor. We always want to say that we're going to buy and hold something indefinitely. But of course, it doesn't always work out that way, that every stock that we buy turns out to be the perfect investment. Uh, Maya, let me start with you on this question is, do you ever get tempted to sell any of the companies that you bought? Or or what would be something that you would see that would make you sell a stock? Yeah, um, I I don't think I've sold anything major yet. Um, I have held Metal through thick and thin. It's not doing too great, but I didn't put a ton of money in it because I started uh-huh. young. So that's sort of the advantage that I was talking about earlier. There's no significant sums and I've made enough early mistakes with $25 or $10 um, that it hasn't hurt too badly. I've also received a lot of advice that when you're this young to just kind of wait things out um, and to give it time. And it's kind of better to close your Schwab account or whatever brokerage account and just don't look at it for a little bit. Um, and when there's good opportunities to buy, go do that, but really don't don't look and don't get too hung up on the down. Makes a lot of sense, Maya. Anything to add, Soren? Anything that might make you sell a stock over time? Um, yeah, so recently I've been shifting my portfolio away from industrial companies, which when I was getting started was very much the core of my investing style. Boeing, GM, Polaris, things like that. Just like building a lot of vehicles for the most part. Um, So I have been selling off quite a few of those positions um, because I just want to go into more like insurance and um, just some other different industries that I think are better opportunities. But I haven't really sold any of those at a loss, luckily. Um, And I've held them for five, 10 years in some cases. So I feel like I've given them a decent run already. Um, I usually don't think about selling too often. Um, Whenever I do, I think of Uh, the book 100 Baggers, where they talk about how in order to get a 100 bagger, you usually have to hold it through being down 20% or even more so for extended periods of time before you can actually get that 100 times return. Um, Yeah. That's fantastic. And I've got one last question as we wrap up the show here today. I'll actually answer it first myself to give you all a chance to to think about it because I'm going a bit off script. But I (laughs) wanted to ask, what is one mistake you've made along the way? Uh, We want to make sure that it's clear to anybody watching the program that no one bats 100% in investing. You're not always going to be right all the time. You're not always going to jump in and know everything immediately. But I'd like to kind of take comfort in having the discussion about realizing that there are mistakes that we make. And maybe we can each all point out one that we run into. 
Uh, myself, when I started investing, you know, putting myself on the spot here, was jumping in too quickly uh, to what I would consider to be the hype cycle. I looked for things that were in the news, that were in the headlines, it was getting a whole lot of attention, not considering valuations, not considering the fundamental business itself, and how they were actually going to capture profits. Uh, because when we talk about investing, we talk about in compounding, we talk about long term, it's really a company is a compounder of your capital. And they've got to find a way to not just grow the top line in revenue, but actually capture profits for shareholders. That's something that I wish that I had known uh, in my first few years of investing. I was just going out and chasing what was making the headlines and the, the top line growth. Uh, Maya, how about you? Is there any mistakes that you can remember that you made kind of early on that you'd like to pass on to other early investors? Yeah, in that similar vein, I think not asking enough questions. Um, now, when I go and research a company, I have a whole document of every question. So as I'm going through their 10K, um, as I answer another question, there's four more that pop up. And so being able to answer all of those and seek out the resources, I think also as a woman specifically, it can be hard to look for the right resources or want to go ask people um, it can feel intimidating. There's imposter syndrome, all of those things. And so being able just either when you're researching a company, um, when you want to learn more about investing in different people's philosophies, being okay with asking questions and um, making your voice heard is something that I'm still trying to learn, but definitely have learned along the way. Ask more questions. That's a great one of my anything to add, Soren, anything that you've made a mistake along the way? Definitely. Um, yeah, I think always ask more questions is great, no matter how much research you do it's always you can always learn more um but for personally i've made a ton of mistakes i'd say most notably often uh looking for a lot of growth in statistics like roic and roe as opposed to um or and not looking as much into price to earnings price to cash flow price to book whatever you're using for a given company and kind of sacrificing that um often too much so so I think just waiting for the right price or being okay with letting opportunities go um, is definitely a mistake I've made. Great one. Great one, Soren. You mentioned ROIC, return on invested capital, ROE, return on equity, of course, profitability metrics that show that you're getting a bang for your buck from the companies that you're investing in. Hey, Maya, hey, Soren, this is a lot of fun. Thanks very much for joining me on the 7 Investing Podcast today. Thanks for, Thank having, you for having us. This was great. I really like to unlock these discussions and 7 Investing is very committed to the educational component of investing, we do have a student rate that is available for $84 a year for anyone that has a .edu email address. Take advantage of that offer. I think that $7 a month is a pretty low tuition to learn about investing in something that can impact the rest of your life. Uh, starting in January and February of next year, we're also going to be having a monthly students-only call with 7investing where you can ask questions in a safe environment it's okay because there are no dumb questions. We're all in this to learn together and to benefit from investing over the long periods of time. So again, Maya and Soren, Maya and Soren Peterson, um, their book is Early Bird, The Power of Investing Young. It's really a pleasure having both of them on the program here today. Hey, uh, Maya and Sora Peterson, thanks very much for joining me. I really had a lot of fun. Thank you for having us. And thanks everybody for tuning into this edition of our 7 Investing Podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7investing.